Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. So I'm going to start a new series today. Um, I think it's probably going to be about five parts because I want to be very thorough with the information and I want to do it in a way that's bite size because people don't want to listen to anything over 30 minutes because we're lazy and not good Bereans. So we are going to break it down into the simplest form I can possibly do. Uh, we are going to establish everything on the witness of two or three or 10 <laughs> in this case. Uh, and we're just going to be very thorough about this. Uh, so a little bit of housekeeping. I have had a couple of people say that they are not getting notifications. I do not understand YouTube. I, I'm, I'm about as technical as the dog, so forgive me, but I have heard <laughs> that if you unsubscribe and then immediately resubscribe, but hit the bell twice, that is what gets you the notifications. Otherwise, if you've only hit the bell once, you only get certain notifications, and I don't know what triggers notifications and what doesn't. So anyway, there's that. So, so what we are going to be talking about in this series is the fact that so many in the church are teaching that we're in the millennial reign right now. And I'm sure that's probably pretty surprising to you because they 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 don't say this openly um, unless you're kind of already down the down the path, if you will. So I'm hoping to kind of expose some of the things that that might be a trigger as to oh that's that's where they're getting that that from, uh, and so. There again, some people are are openly declaring this, um, but but most are not, and so and a lot of people, a lot of these people that are that have this doctrine and are teaching this as as truth, um, they they have millions of followers, and so it behooves us as good students of the word of God, not students of people, but students of the word of God to, to look at these things. And so hopefully by discussing some of these things, you'll see some of the things it'll trigger. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. And you'll see where the teachings originate from. So again, they are teaching that we are ruling and reigning on Christ's behalf on earth. I have even heard people say that if this is actually not the case, if, if we are not ruling and reigning on Christ's behalf on earth, that Christ was a false prophet. Now, again, these are their words. They're not mine uh, making that distinction. So with that view, no Christian is going to be part of a tribulation because the tribulation has already happened. And things are going to continue to get better and better until we experience this golden age of sorts, um, which is ultimately reflected in the areas of politics, entertainment, family, and social life. Christians are tasked, they say, with, the, with extending the kingdom of God through the avenues, through all those avenues that I just listed, as well as social justice. Sometimes um, we are to take over the culture, seven mountain mandate. Um, and so we're going to break this down. We're going to, we're going to try to break all of this down here. And so the doctrine starts mostly, you can really tell if someone has this belief because they are going to base it on Matthew 16, 28 and Matthew 24, 34, where Jesus said some, that uh, some standing there would not taste death until they see the son of man coming in his kingdom. And then it was this generation that would not pass away until all of these things have happened. So when Jesus was speaking in Matthew 24, their assertion is that Jesus was only speaking 
to those present at the time that he spoke those words. And that all of this occurred during 70 AD at the destruction of the temple. And that, you know, it, so there, there's no tribulation. It's, it's, it's already passed. It already happened in 70 AD. <clears throat> all, most of Revelation also would be gone with that as well. So there's no tribulation. There's no mark of the beast coming. We are ruling and reigning on Christ's behalf. We are working hard to provide him with a moral society when he returns, which again, that should be a huge red flag for you. If you're in a church or in a teaching person, that's real big on what's been going on in the news, because that is part of the agenda. So from these teachings, the scripture in Matthew 16 and Matthew 24, they're, they're being combined as if the text was all one. And that's simply not the case. I mean, we have the transfiguration between this. They traveled to Galilee. They, taught, they went to Jerusalem. I mean, there was lots of teachings in between. So these two, these two scriptures are not connected as they say they are. And but throughout scripture, we have we have the evidence that while one person may be saying something in a given situation um, and, and it is spoken to those that are hearing it, it is also a it's spoken to be a prophetic event. And so one of the one of the things that we can look at that um, example is in Exodus 4, 22 and 23, where it says, then tell Pharaoh that this is what the Lord says. Israel is my firstborn son, and I told you to let my son go so that he may worship me. But since you have refused to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. So then in Hosea 11, 1, it says, when Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. Now, so you can see that one is speaking of one event, but it's also going to speak of a future event because in Matthew 2, 14 and 15, it says, so he got up and took the child and his mother by night and withdrew to Egypt where he stayed until the death of Herod. This fulfilled what the Lord had spoken through the prophet out of Egypt. I have called my son. So again, he, the Lord speaks in multi-fold meanings and, and it's consistent throughout scripture to, so to say that in this particular instance, he's only speaking to these people and this has already happened. I mean, that, that would be a stretch because that would be unusual for the Bible, actually. Uh, the, the Bible is actually written down. The whole Bible is written down for our instruction. So we should be instructed by it rather than saying, oh, well, that doesn't apply to us. So we also have an example in uh, God promising David that he would not lack a man to sit on his throne in First Chronicles 17 and Psalm 89. So he was told that his son would build a house and that his throne would be established forever. So again, Solomon did sit on the throne and he also did build a house for the Lord. But being a multifold promise, David spoke in Psalm 110, 1, a Psalm of David, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. So all of these things were ultimately pointing to Jesus. You know, it's... <laughs> It's Jesus that would build a house and his throne would be established forever, not Solomon's. It's, it's, you, you can clearly see that these are multifold prophetic things that, again, it, occur, it occurs throughout the Bible. Jesus is sitting on the Davidic throne and this was promised to him by the father. So, you know, one could try to say that some of the events that were described in Matthew 24, some of those things did take place in 70 AD. You know, as as the, the prophetic warning came, some Christians were able to escape to Pella 
to avoid the physical city of Jerusalem being destroyed. But this isn't the only thing that is said to have to occur within the text. So when Jesus was speaking of the temple in Matthew 24, 2, it says, truly, I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. So I'm going to point out here that if the only meaning here is the destruction of the physical temple, then Jesus would be a false prophet by their standard, not mine, their standard, because lots of stones are still standing upon one another. People by the hundreds and the thousands go to these stones every single day when they go to, some people call it the Wailing Wall, some people call it the Western Wall, and it is in Jerusalem. So there you have that. But really, ultimately, what is overlooked in that is that Jesus is the chief cornerstone, the stone the builders rejected. It was not the physical stones. So right before telling the disciples that there were some standing there that would not taste death before seeing his kingdom, he asked them pointedly, who do you say that I am? And Peter's response is, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus responds, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. Verse 18, Jesus says, and I also say to you that you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Now, uh, we know that Peter's name means rock, but Jesus is not going to build his church on Peter. (laughs) Rather, he's going to build his church church on Peter's response of, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus is the prophet that God promised would be raised up in Deuteronomy 18. It's his words that speak what the father commands. And Jesus told us in John 14, 24, whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not my own, but it is from the Father who sent me. Acts 4.11 says, This Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. That's also in Psalm 118.22. So Jesus is the cornerstone. Isaiah 28.16. So this is what the Lord God says. See, I lay in a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. The one who believes will never be shaken. And it is upon the foundation of Jesus, the precious cornerstone, the builders build upon. Peter's, uh, Peter is a builder, but he is building upon the foundation of Jesus Christ, the, the son of the living God being the chief cornerstone. So Jesus told the people who were seeking a sign in John 2, 19 to destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up again. But in verse 21, he says, but Jesus was speaking about the temple of his body. Ephesians 2, 19 through 22 says, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in him the whole body building is fitted together and grows into a holy temple in the lord and in him you too are being built together into a dwelling place for god in his spirit jesus is the temple not the physical copy patterned after the one in heaven He is still being rejected by those builders that were looking for, they're still looking for a future physical temple to be built where animal sacrifices would be reinstated for the atonement of sin. When Jesus shed blood is the only true sacrifice that can take away sin. The stones had been built on the foundation of a physical temple where animal sacrifices took place and not on Christ and his sacrifice becoming the cornerstone. 
with Christ as the cornerstone, the apostles built a foundation and we are to take heed as to how we build on this foundation. The people of God are all the people of God. It is the Israel of God, one new man from the two, Jew and Gentile, both reconciled to God in one body through the cross, Ephesians 2, 15 and 16. There is not going to be any physical earthly temple that would be honored by God because that would be a slap in the face to Jesus Christ, number one. And do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17 1 Corinthians 6, 19, and 2 Corinthians 6, 16. Jesus is the, the high priest. He's the only high priest. And he is the only sacrifice that God is going to honor. So if, if Jesus meant that the people to whom he was speaking to was the generation that would not pass away until all, all, had that he had spoken in Matthew 24 um, had come to pass, we, we do have some disconnects to piece together. And that's where it gets really interesting. At least I thought it was interesting. <clears throat> but the word here, all, it is actually not, a, you know, it's it's in there. It's It wasn't added by the translators. And it does mean each, every part in totality. So Jesus said, in Matthew 24, verse 29 through 31, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the powers of he the heavens will be shaken. At that time, the son of man will appear in heaven and all of the tribes of the earth will mourn. That's also repeated in Revelation 117. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. Now, this event is called the Day of the Lord, which we're going to look at. We're, we're going to talk about that. But this day is not an interval of light between darkness, like what, what we would call the day. <laughs> that day is a person, and he is the firstborn over all creation that was created in Genesis 1-3. And if you would like some further teaching on that, you can watch the video that I did called Salt and Light. So <clears throat> one disconnect that we're going to talk about here is in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 17, where it says, Brothers, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you will not grieve like the rest who are without hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, we also believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. By the word of the Lord, we declare to you that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will be the first to rise. After that, we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. So as we can read, this is consistent with what Jesus stated in Matthew. If the day of the Lord has already occurred, we are told that those in Christ who are sleeping in death are going to be the first to rise. And this is consistent with Revelation 24 and 5 that says, Then I saw the thrones, and those seated on them had been given authority to judge, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus. My, you're not alive if you're beheaded. Let's use the little noggins there. 
They were beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God. And those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and it had not received its mark on their foreheads or hands. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come back to life until the thousand years were complete. This is the first resurrection. So Revelation 20 tells us that during the millennial reign, Satan has been bound. He cannot deceive the nations. So if Satan, the God of this world, is bound, if we're in the millennial reign, he would be bound, okay, then he would be unable to deceive. So how is it that people are still deceived? And how is it that we're still able to cast out demons? If, if, if we're in the millennial reign, uh, where, where are the martyrs? Where are the people that we just read about that were supposed to, that were promised to come back to life and reign with Christ for a thousand years? Don't see those people either. The text clearly states that they came to life and it is they that reign with Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, 50, it says, Now I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. And in verse 53, it says, For the perishable must be clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. So it cannot be those of us still in a human flesh body. It has, it's those that have received their imperishable bodies that reign with Christ. That is what the text says. So another disconnect. Uh, Those that heard Jesus speaking, they, they would have recognized the part that he said about the sun and the moon not giving light. I mean, this was referenced in 18 chapters of scripture. And so they would have had an idea of how to correctly understand them. And so I, I, this is, this is where I got really sort of troubled in this part because there is so much scripture there. It is, it just goes on and on and on and on. And it is very plain, but to take the time to read out on camera all of those scriptures. I mean, we would be sitting here for hours and nobody would listen and it, it really wouldn't behoove me to do it. So instead of doing that, I, I, I have cut it down to some very short scriptures to kind of discuss this. So the first one is going to be Isaiah 13, 6 through 13 that says, Wail, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. Therefore, all hands will fall limp and every man's heart will melt. Consistent with Luke 21, 26. Terror, pain, anguish will seize them. They will writhe like a woman in labor. Also consistent with Matthew 24, 8 and 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 3. They will look at one another, their faces flushed with fear. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, cruel with fury and burning anger to make the earth a desolation and to destroy the sinners within it. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light. The rising sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will end the haughtiness of the arrogant and lay low the pride of the ruthless. I will make man scarcer than pure gold and mankind rarer than the gold of Ophir. Therefore, I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will be shaken from its place at the wrath of the Lord of hosts on the day of his burning anger. 
consistent with Matthew 24, 29. So Isaiah 34, 1 through 4 says, Come near, O nations, to listen. Pay attention, O peoples. Let the earth hear and all that fills it, the world and all that springs from it. The Lord is angry with all the nations and furious with all their armies. He will devote them to destruction. He will give them over to slaughter. Their slain will be left unburied and the stench of their corpses will rise. The mountains will flow with their blood. All of the stars of heaven will be dissolved. The skies will be rolled up like a scroll and all their stars will fall like withered leaves from the vine, like foliage from the fig tree. Also consistent with what Jesus said in Matthew 24, but is also repeated in 2 Peter 3, 10 through 12 and Revelation 6, 12 through 13. So the whole of Joel, the whole thing you can, you can read, but I'll take a couple of scriptures here. Uh, Joel 2, 1 and 2 says, blow the ram's horn. Uh, in Zion, sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Let all who dwell in the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. Indeed, it is near, a day of darkness and of gloom, a day of clouds and blackness, like the dawn overspreading the mountains. A great and strong army appears, such of such as never was of old, nor will be in ages to come. And in verse 10 through 12, it says, Before them the earth quakes, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon grow dark, and the stars lose their brightness. The Lord raises his voice in the presence of his army. Indeed, his camp is very large, for mighty are those who obey his command. For the day of the Lord is great and very dreadful. Who can endure it? So Isaiah and Joel, they were speaking to the people at that time. But again, like the whole of scripture continues to speak until the totality of what God meant comes to pass. So again, I listed a few scriptures here, but if you are truly interested, you can go read Isaiah 2 through 5, chapter 13, chapter 24, chapter 27 through 29, Ezekiel 13, Ezekiel 30, all of Joel, Amos 5, Obadiah, Zephaniah 1, and Zechariah 14, because they all say the same things about the events of the sun, the moon, the stars being the day of the Lord. So go look out your front door and ask yourself, are you seeing the sun? Do you, do you see that big bright light out there? Is the moon still giving, you know, its light? Are there still stars at night? Is the earth a desolation? Are, are there still sinners on it? Of course there are. Isaiah 13 really speaks about the burden against Babylon and 34 is regarding the nations. You know, Joel is speaking about the locusts and boy, these are all consistent with what is written in Revelation. If we will have ears to hear. <clears throat> Second Peter 1, 16 through 19 says, for we did not follow cleverly devised fables when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty for he received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came from him came to him from the maj majestic glory saying this is my son in whom I am well pleased and we ourselves heard this voice from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain we also have the word of the prophets as confirmed beyond any doubt. And you would do well to pay attention to it as a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns. 
day of the Lord and the morning star rises in your hearts. Acts 3, 19 through 21 says, Repent then and turn back so that your sins may be wiped away, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus, the Christ, who, was, who has been appointed for you. Heaven must take him until the time comes for the restoration of all things, which God announced long ago through his holy prophets. All of the words of the prophets, and I am not talking about these prophets today. I, I am talking about those that were chosen by God. They are written in the Bible. It's written down for our instruction, and they are going to come to pass. Everything that they said, and we're going to look at a whole bunch of it here. That's why this is going to be a long series. But Jesus was not introducing something new. He knew the context of what he was saying. When he spoke, he knew all of it, all that had been previously written. And every matter has been established upon the witnesses of two or three. And again, we're going to we're going to look at this because it all pertains to the day of the Lord. And I can't I can't address it. <laughs> every instance, you know, because again, we'd be here for, for hours and hours and days, but man, it sure would behoove us to search these things out and be good students of the Lord and his word, because this occurs immediately after the tribulation. And this was the point where Jesus in Matthew 24, 33 through 35 said, So also when you see all these things, you will know that he is near, right at the door. Truly, I tell you, it is that generation. This generation will not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. It is the generation that sees all all of it, all the things, the wars, rumors of wars, the nations rising against one another, the famines, the earthquakes, the persecutions, the love of many growing cold with betrayals against one another, the dismay of nations, the tribulation, the sun and the moon not giving their light. All of that has to occur before he returns. And it makes sense that seeing all of those things at once causes perplexity, anxiety, doubt. It's a quandary upon the earth. Men fainting from fear and anxiety over what they see. The powers of the heavens being shaken, which is a reference to Hebrews 12, 26 and 29 through 29, excuse me, and Haggai 2, 6. It is after this that we will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. And again, if you are a good student, you will go read the scriptures that I have provided to you and you will see without a doubt, it is absolutely indisputable, indisputable that this has not all yet occurred. If people are convinced that these events in Matthew 24 have already occurred, it, these things will surely come like a flood upon them. So, beloved, I'm blowing the ram's horn. I was listening to something and, you know, it seemed like many young women were sensing. They're, they're sensing. Young, young women are sensing. Well, probably a lot of other people besides young women, but young women specifically you know, who are just getting ready to get married or thinking about getting married or they just got married, you know, and they're, they're listening to what Jesus spoke and, and they're, they're, they're asking the question, well, should I, should, should I have children at this point? And this man, is, why would you not have children? Things are just going to get better and better and better and better. And they're just lying to you. This has all happened. This is all done. You're fine. You're good. Have kids. Have as many kids as you want. And I was just shocked because it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see 
that um, there are food shortages. You can see that there is a starting of dismay of nations. I mean, I don't know if you really watch a lot of what is happening in the world weather-wise, but it is astonishing what what is occurring in, in every nation weather-wise and how land is falling away and sinkholes are just opening up and torrential downpour rain causing flood that you know is waist high through the middle of cities and and it's just you can see all of these things you you can feel that you're we're on the edge we're on the edge of it and so these women are seeking out the advice of these people and they're telling them yes go for it and that is to ignore what jesus said when he said whoa which it means it's an exclamation of grief for women who are pregnant or nursing in those days. So if you are one of those people and you're sensing this for yourself and you are wondering what to do, stick with scripture. Don't listen to what I'm saying. Don't listen to what they're saying. Don't listen to what one other human being on this planet is saying. You are are, you're feeling it on the inside of you. Go to your Bible and study for yourself. Get before the Lord. Fall on your face. Ask him to show you. Be willing to set aside all of your preconceived notions and ideas and, and, and whatever else and follow him because, whoa. So stay tuned for part two. I'm going to end this portion here and I hope that you have a good rest of your day, but I hope that you will continue to come back and listen to the rest of the series because it, there's, there's a lot to unpack here. Have a good day.